like photo science, we uh, mostly cover the, the light based uh, applications of light and the production of light. And applications of light means use of it in different devices engineering as well as in the study of materials. So it spans a range of wavelengths, say starting from X rays up to very long wavelengths, uh, wavelengths like you know, mid infrared wavelengths. So I, I, I believe there are a lot of um, lot of students who have joined this seminar. So I would like to give a quick recap of what is like, and uh, it will probably help you to follow the lectures in the morning and probably the lectures you have in the afternoon as well. So we all know what is light, and uh, there are different sources of light. Um, so it starts from the sun, the, the fire, the fire produce light like candles or uh, other types of fires. And then it changed, made a huge change in terms of the production of light. If the biggest change happened was the uh, incandescent lamp, uh, invention of the incandescent lamp. And then it comes the lasers in the last century, the middle of, uh, almost in the middle of last century. So now there are a plenty of um, you know, number of lasers used in different applications. And it's, now we are using a lot of LED lamps uh, uh, to, uh, you know, day-to-day -day life. So what is the nature of light? The light, light itself <coughs> is produced by the, um, what Maxwell predicted is accelerated electric charges produce electromagnetic waves. So basically, if you take an atom, we know that within an atom, you've got uh, nucleus, the electronics, and so on. So the electrons are, uh, are what is responsible for the production of light. So this in, in itself uh, is uh, manifest in that the light which is produced by an electron, uh, by the movement of an electron, will obviously will contain electric and magnetic field. So that means you have an electromagnetic field, which is the light. So it, it has got because of that, you got the wave nature, and also because the, the, this this uh, light is produced by the, the the movement or jumping of electron from an upper orbital or shell into a lower lower orbital, there is there is a quantum of energy which is emitted, but which we call a photon. So it can have either a wave nature or a, a, a particle nature. So that's the basic concept we have. So I'm just introduced to me uh, recapping this so that you'll have the discussion to follow. And depending on uh, on the energies uh, or the energy level from which the, elect the electron be excites, you can have energies of the photon, which are different um, uh, uh, energies of the photons, which may be low or high. And the frequency of uh, so in the same way, if you have an external uh, energy is absorbed by an atom, um, the, the, it can uh, can excite the uh, the, uh, the atom as well. Okay, so when it de excites, it, it emits at a certain frequency, and by knowing the frequency of that, we know what is the energy of the photon produced. So this this uh, production of electromagnetic waves. Uh, can range from say gamma rays up to say uh, radio waves. If you if you compare the size of the wave, this is how the different wavelengths compare. Say for example, in the visible range, which we can see from 300 to 700 nanometer, uh, uh, it is kind of on the size of that or, or the wavelength of that uh, particular range of uh, electromagnetic wave of light is of kind of of the size of the bacteria, for example. So it kind of ex explains, um, you know, what wavelength should be used for a particular application. So most of these range of wavelengths are used for a number of applications, and in particular, you are familiar with the, the mobile uh, or uh, mobile phone uh, that you use. So there, there are these range of wavelengths or frequency corresponding to the megahertz to gigahertz being used in the microwave region for the uh, communication of uh, uh, the mobile phone communication that you are uh, using. So there are a range of applications of the electromagnetic waves, for, uh, uh, and most part <coughs> of the spectrum are being utilized 
for different application. Whether it is for um, it is for a starting from cooking to you know to communicating. So I'm communicating to the through this medium to you uh, using uh, you know these electromagnetic waves at certain uh, 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 certain wavelengths through different media. So that's how you are able to see me and also listen to me in this webinar as well. So we need to also um, consider, so we will uh, focus on basically the optical side of this. Optical side of this uh, uh, um, means it's a certain part of the wavelength uh, which we use for different applications. So simply when an electromagnetic wave interacts with any matter, any matter, uh, there are three basic processes can happen. So we call it, the, the, you know, you know, electromagnetic radiation, if it interacts with the matter, it can either transmit through the matter or it can get absorbed in the matter or can get uh, uh, reflected or scattered uh, of the matter. So it could be a glass or it could be a, 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 a electric medium like glass or any other metal or other materials. So, so the material property determines the ability of light to uh, penetrate to that material or whether it gets absorbed or it gets scattered. So one important application of the light is I mentioned is in optical communication. So it depends on which wavelength of light we want to use for this particular application. So we all know that when we are talking a part, uh, when I am talking to you, a part of this information is uh, reaching to you through a network of optical fibers which spans across the globe. So there are a, uh, so these are undersea networks. You can see the image which I have shown at the bottom, which connecting the different continents. So we are basically physically con uh, connected in a sense with all different continents to this network of optical fibers through which the information which I am uh, which is transmitted across. So how is the information transmitted through this optical fiber network? Or what is the what is the um, wavelength or what is the um, medium that allows us to uh, communicate? So we uh, most of you probably are familiar with this uh, uh, total internal reflection of light when the light goes to a uh, you know a denser medium to a rarer medium at certain angles of incidence the light reflects back. So in an optical fiber, if, if you uh, have a denser medium, it is a cylindrical fiber, which is simply a uh, glass, which is uh, um, form, uh, produced in the form of a, of a uh, very thin fiber. So the, when the glass has, since the glass has got um, a core and a cladding, the core means a high refractive index or highly dense, um, middle part, and also it is covered by a cladding. The light can essentially totally internal reflect and it can go through it. So the wavelength of that light, which is uh, most suitable in silica, anything which is, as I mentioned before, when it passes through a medium, it can get absorbed, it can get uh, um, scattered, or <coughs> it can get transmitted. So since glass in this to the glass, you know that it's mostly transparent and it transmits, but the glass is more, more transparent at a wavelength around uh, 1,500 nanometers. So that is the wavelength of light which is um, less attenuated or less, um, very less lost due to communication. And that's why that particular range of wavelength is used for communication. So in this optical fiber link that connects the different continents um, this is um, uh, this is the wavelength range, or uh, it is um, centered around 15 uh, in 1,515 nanometer. Is what is used for the communication. So as we as I mentioned before, since there is a loss, you cannot just send light from one end. So you can produce these wavelengths using a laser, and then uh, modulate it and send the information across this optical fiber. But since the Half optical fiber is a material which contains what you call a silica based glass. Uh, it has got a certain loss. The light will not sustain for a very long distance without being lost or attenuated. So, in that respect, we need to amplify the light in between. 
So there are so many optical fiber amplifiers within the, uh, the Sunder C network, uh, which is used to amplify the light uh, or amplify the information which is sent across, uh, sent to it uh, to be not lost. So this is uh, some basic introduction. And in case of absorption, you know the devices which works on absorption of light, which involves solar cells. And then another simple concept, or, or it looks simple, uh, a concept of uh, laser, which involves production of uh, light as well as amplifying it to, by using uh, a medium, what you call the amplifying mediums, so where the, the light is produced. And then use a mirror to choose a particular wavelength within that amplification range to produce light of a single wavelength or, or a very narrow wavelength uh, at a high intensity. So what we call the um, uh, laser light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So I'm kind of what is photonics means in that case. So it involves the different parts of what I have discussed in a very briefly, which contains light, optics, and, and lasers. All of that area of research or, or technology, what we call photonics. So the optics is basically contains the manipulation of light or the, the components that we use to manipulate the light, changes propagation, uh, focus it, reflect it, and so on. So and uh, it is the electromagnetic waves which is produced by different sources of uh, sources which uh, and they also include in that and the lasers are which used to amplify the light uh, or, or, or to create high intensity light sources. And the application of these uh, and the in different areas is all uh, be part of photonics. Now what uh, we do at University of Leeds in, in my research group what we essentially work on is photonic materials. The materials just got light emitting properties or which um, or we use um, say light or lasers to study such materials and the production of devices out of such materials is an important aspect of uh, my research groups research. So the core materials that we uh, work on in, uh, in my research group is what we call the landonite doped glasses. Um, that means we know all glasses, we, glasses used in windows and uh, in, in, in mirrors and so on. Uh, they are mostly based on what you call so the main component of those glasses is silica, and then you have other um, glass, what you call glass modifiers or, or uh, you know, doped pens and so on. So these glasses, which are uh, specialized glasses, used for light emission. So for example, shown here for the blue emission, which is, uh, so this is produced by doping these glasses with the lanthanide, which are shown at the bottom of this, uh, the first row of the, uh, sorry, uh, of the, shown here in the periodic table. So these ions or, or the elements are capable of emitting light when they are ionic states within a glass material. So this can then be used for the uh, production of lasers or different types of light emitting, uh, um, different applications of uh, light emission that they can introduce. They can also be these ions, these lanthanide ions can also be introduced into you know, very small particles or nanoparticles. Uh, for example, uh, in this case, um, what is called the chlorine. Right? And uh, these particles, when they are, they can emit light, say visible light, uh, when you excite it with a, or it, uh, when you excite it with an infrared light. So this is very important for many applications like biological imaging and biosensing. So these are two different areas. In, so most of this research involves use of earth ions in different host materials, either in nanoparticles or in uh, glasses, which can be produced using um, you know, chemical methods or using laser uh, deposition. So the beauty of landonite is that you can choose different types of landonite ions like say, thulium, erbium, europium, all these are different uh, um, lanthanide ions, which are capable of emitting light 
and different wavelengths as we have see shown here. So this is why they are used in a range of light emitting applications, for example, LEDs, lasers, and amplifiers, and bioimaging. So the, 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 the particular application we started focusing on in, in my research group was use of these ions into uh, uh, the uh, kind of using photonic integration application. So we, we know that there are, uh, the, you, you probably are familiar with electronic integration and you have a talk on silicon photonics in the afternoon. So we will learn more about integration of optical component onto a chip. And it's important in many aspects. As we know that the, the, the electronic integrated circuits are uh, going, I mean, going to their limit in terms of how many components you can integrate per unit area or unit volume. So this is, uh, that means that if you want to introduce further functionalities onto uh, an electronic, uh, uh, electronic chip, for example, a processor, we need to have a new, uh, uh, we need to have another layer of, um, say, photonic components in order to enhance its uh, functionality. And this is becoming increasingly important as we are using more, more computing, uh, more processing requirements are coming up. But in silicon, you, uh, one of the issues is that you haven't got, you can, you can integrate a lot of photonic components onto the silicon, but there are losses in that material. So I said we are using light or the lasers to communicate in a photonics circuit, which is essentially using photons to say uh, um, process data or uh, process data. In that case, we need to, there will be loss in the, in the transmission of photons to that material. So we need to amplify it at certain point of time. But in silicon, this is hard to achieve. Uh, um, indirectly in, in to because you need to create some light emitting within the silicon to produce that amplification. So you, the, because uh, for that, we, um, one of the approaches that we propose here might be useful. So I'm not going into more details of silicon photonics such as you have a very good expert who is um, presenting it uh, in the afternoon. So in, in, in a simplest case, okay, either we, we communicate with the or between us either through voice data or video and you have these transmitters which transmit uh, of this this uh, this information either and then you multiplex it and then you send it across an optical fiber at some point in the communication network and within that optical fiber you need an amplification uh, uh, amplification of the signal so we, we need to, in the case of silicon uh, photonics, we, we need to have this amplification capability, which is, uh, which is to be something in the form of, say, an integrated uh, amplifier. So what is available currently is an optical fiber amplifier. An optical fiber amplifier is something of this size. So it contains uh, the input optical fibers where the signal going in and the output of eagle fiber where the signal is amplified and coming back. So within this box, you have a long, about, about 10 meter long optical fiber, which amplifies the signal. And what does this optical fiber different from the normal optical fiber is that this optical fiber is dropped with a particular rare ion called RBM3 plus or RBM ion. And why is this RBM ion important? is the RBM ion has got an energy level diagram, which is, uh, which is kind of shown here in this figure. So this RBM ion has, when you excite it into the, to the level three here, then it has got an ability to emit uh, in the wavelength range 15, 50 nanometer. So this is kind of a, kind of a, uh, a, a fortunate coincidence that this emission of this RBM ions is, uh, it's compatible with the, the low loss uh, transmission window of the optical fiber. So the opti RBM the fiber amplifiers are widely used 
and they are used to networking to you. Okay, this is going to some like a bin of example at some point. So, <clears throat> so they are they are the industry standard, and they are used in communication, and these fibers are produced in in in, a, in, in sufficient quantity, and they they do the job. The, the issue with again, the only drawback with the wind of fiber amplifiers are since it is a one dimensional uh, amplification, and this is uh, you need a long fiber. And the fiber uh, should, is around 10, my, uh, 10 meters, so it is bound in this small box here. So they are, they are bulky and cannot, cannot be miniaturized uh, in, 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 in the current scenario. So what what is uh, what so why they are why do we need ten meter long fiber? If you put a, if you put a lot of ABM ions, you can have the amplification in a short length. But the issue with the silica, the material that is used for uh, for these ABM dog fiber amplifiers, is that the if, um, there is a limit up to which you can put ABM ions into that, especially or uh, 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 the solubility of silica uh, uh, of ABM in silica is limited, and at the same time, if you put too much ABM into it, then you have the the the, the there be interaction between it, the ABM ions, and which reduces the overall gain or the amplification which can which we can obtain from an optical fiber. And if you put too much ABM into uh, silica, for example, it can start forming clusters within the within the material so it's like if you put too much um, uh, uh, roots into a plum cake you know it can settle at the at, at the bottom other than or it, it gets clustered in the in, in the cake so it won't be very nice okay so the concept of optical waveguide or the plan of optical waveguide uh, amplifiers which is not new it's been around for uh, many years but it's about how do we achieve sufficient optical gain which, is, uh, which we can achieve which we can obtain from an optical fiber in a very short compact uh, amplifying device so idea is same as that of an optical fiber you produce this guiding wave guiding uh, uh, wave guiding layer on a substrate which is probably a few centimeters long, or we can make it as small as we can, say a centimeter or less than a centimeter long. So you create a wave guiding channel within this material. So if this channel is not, the channel is nothing but it is a region of the um, dielectric material, which is um, a, um, or, or semiconductor material with a very low loss, which can, which can uh, guide the light through that. So so it has got a high refractive index comparing to that of the surrounding medium, so that it can, it it, uh, it guides the light. So if there is no dopants like uh, beyond in this material, then it is basically simply a passive waveguide. So, so you can make this waveguide into different shapes and uh, um, and can be used for different applications as well, like for splitting of light, combining of light, and so on. But if you dock these waveguides with the uh, active ions, then we can uh, amplify the light and produce, say, for example, lasers or amplifiers on a chip. So that is a kind of a basic component of indeg photonic integration uh, of amplifiers um, amplifier on a chip. So there are different methods used uh, and uh, been tried for this uh, particular application. So the research that I, uh, um, I show here in our research group, we use a particular method called laser plasma doping. So in this laser plasma doping, using this uh, equipment here, which contains a, a large laser. And uh, we use that laser to ablate materials containing, say, FBM ions in it, and to uh, use a substrate, which is a glass, which can, uh, this material can then basically diffuse into the glass diffuse into the glass and produce that active layer on it. So this is the unique method we developed here. So in most cases, you deposit on the surface, but in this case, you produce a layer which is diffused into the surface. So, and uh, the laser that we also use is uh, uh, this unique, what we call the uh, femtosecond laser. 
So these lasers are lasers which produce very short pulses, and uh, um, the duration of those pulses are in the range of say 45 to 100 uh, femtosecond, that is 1 to the power of minus 15 second. So that's like a lot of photon in a very short time duration, hitting the material, uh, making it literally to ablate or evaporate uh, and to deposit on a substrate, which is subsequently getting diffused into the substrate to produce that wave guiding range region that we've been discussing. So within that process, we introduced these dopants, which are suitable for amplification. So this is what happens when the laser hits the surface of this um, of this um, uh, target glass which, or target material, which contains the dopant, and then we uh, transport it across onto the substrate, which is actually the one which becoming the amplifier. So when we did hit the target, it's basically depending on the focusing conditions, how the laser was focused, uh, depending on the energy density of or the fluence of the laser, um, the, 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 the spot at which the material being evaporated or ablated uh, is different. So you want to create a uniform ablation, something similar to that of D, so we can optimize the different energy densities and to get uniform ablation of this material. So one difference with the ablating materials with the center second laser, with laser like this, with the uh, uh, wavelength, say, in the near infrared. Um, there are people use uh, uh, ablation of UV using using UV lasers as well. In the difference in this case is this is a this is a process in which the light interacts with the matter. Yeah, the, as we mentioned before. The, the 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 scattering the absorption and the and the transmission so in this case the light being absorbed in a very small uh, area or volume at the focal spot and it subsequently produces the um, material to or, or um, to, to produce a plasma or a plate from its surface so creating a huge intensity of energy focused at the surface so with the ablation of this material, essentially what is coming out is it was a UV laser, it is mostly will be ionized plasma. So it will contain mostly ions of that particular material. So if it is silica, say for example, it will be like silicon and oxygen, it contains silicon and oxygen. So it will be the silicon, uh, silicon ions and oxygen ions, so two minus uh, and, um, and, and silicon ions. So depending on what your components, it will be that case. But in the case of use of femtosecond laser, it's mostly produces, uh, almost 95% produces nanoparticles uh, to ablate from the surface. So instead of completely ionizing the material or nearly completely, uh, uh, nearly ablating all of it into ions, it's ablating into, uh, uh, into nanoparticles and subsequently deposits on the surface. So we can optimize this process to get a uniform plasma to form this layer. So what is different from typical deposition process? So you, um, if you, for example, when you coat the surface of the paint the surface, what you forming is a thin layer on the on the surface. Yeah, we paint our house. So what it is forming is the paint is forming a thin layer on the outer surface of it. But can we diffuse into the into the uh, uh, into the material on which we are coating. So that's what we are achieving here. So in creating the plasma, which is actually going into the glass. So in creating the uh, thicker and thicker layers by by uh, uh, by running this process for a very long time. So with that, you modifying the surface layer of say a glass, silica glass, which is used in this case. So this is a typical example of it. So we, we kind of mask some areas. We can only make it happen only on certain areas we have shown to have the dot here. So we are using the mask. So the material is getting implanted or diffused into the glass on the very surface. So how does it look like if you if you slice it? If you slice that material, we can see the different layers are formed. So ignore the top layer at the uh, top right layer here. So this is where the glass starts from or the substrate surface starts from. So with this process, you're creating a layer which is modified 
uh, from the original substrate. So the original substrate in this case was silica, and you're creating you know, implanted or diffused layer here, or what we call the dog layer, we call it different ways at different times. So this dog layer is, um, is different from that of the substrate in terms of its refractive index and its composition. So the refractive index is essentially we, uh, we have a higher refractive index because of the densification of the layer and because of the modification of the composition of material in that layer. So, uh, so in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, substrate, it remains unchanged, and that is the layer that is the uniqueness of this particular process we used, and uh, the details are uh, reported in this paper. So we can analyze the materials in that particular layer. Right? This is a slice which is produced using what we call focused ion beam. So you create a very thin layer of around 100 nanometer thick and to analyze this material within that layer. So this is like slicing a piece of cake uh, out of the cake. So if it is like a, 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 a multiple layered cakes, then you can see the different layers in it. Yeah. And um, the, the, the thing is that you, you create an icing on the top sometimes, the icing will just stay on the top. And you can also create a bit more um, dilute icing, then it can actually infuse into the cake. So that's what's more similar to what's happening here. So you're creating the materials to go into the glass or into the, uh, and modify it. So we can analyze this using different elements and then confirm which of the, uh, whether all those elements present in the target material, which we ablated using or evaporated using the laser is present in the, in that uh, drop layer or implanted layer, which is shown here in this figure. So this is that anal analysis showing the different components which is present up to that interface between the dog and undog layer. So this is the key material uh, uh, process that we developed in my lab uh, for engineering surface of say glasses, polymers, or semiconductor materials, and which can be used for uh, optical and other uh, photonic and other applications. So a detailed look at the cross section, you can see clearly um, how the dog layer is different from the original glass. You can see the interface clearly. And this is the uniqueness of this process. You get a very sharp interface between the dog and the, the undog layer. So this is show, looking at a very uh, you know, high magnification. You can see the scale here, which is in 100 nanometer. And this is uh, uh, taken using a uh, uh, transmission electron microscope. So this is another, so we can control the thickness of that layer, the refractive index of that layer, the, the, the different ions that we want to put in uh, um, by controlling the process. So it can be analyzed using different methods we are shown here. The one of the differences uh, from a typical, what you call the ion implantation is that there's a, there's a similar method used by what you call the ion implantation, that you use individual ions at accelerated and then uh, individual into the material. In many cases, it's like, you know, the ions will, uh, in, the, in a traditional ion implantation process, the ions will go deeper into the glass, not from the surface, it goes deep into the glass and then you build that layer. So you get a profile of ions like that uh, within the material, within the sub, you know, within kind of a substrate, like me, the, what they call the target material. So, um, so you will have a profile like that and the refractive index profile will not be uh, kind of a step index, it will not be a step change, it can, uh, can have different shapes depending on the ion profile or the, the ion which is implanted into the material. So here we can see much more like a step profile in our uh, material. So this can also be applied onto a silica, on a silicon substrate. So the, here it shows the implanted layer. So we started with a thick silica layer on a silicon, and then you apply the process, and then you create an implanted layer. So all of this contains uh, parts of silica, and also this implanted layer. So, and the silicon remains the same. So if you run the process for longer time, you basically can convert all of that silica layer into both layer. So here you can see if you run too long, you can some of these uh, materials or elements within the within the 
plasma gets crystallized at the interface between the silica and silicon plant, and uh, uh, it's reported in this paper. So, the ultra fast laser plasma doping is the key uh, um, technology that we developed in, in my research group for various applications in photonics and so on. As I already discussed, so it's kind of introducing new ions into the surface of a material and engineering its surface for the, to create uh, photonic functionalities. In this case, it can get mechanical functionalities, which will be discussed later on as well. Now, once you produce a drop layer, uh, say for example, photonic applications, how do we characterize that layer? So one of the methods used to, uh, so we need to know what is called the refractive index of that layer. That's very key. If I discuss in the optical fiber case or in the waveguide, planar waveguide case, we need to have a core or high refractive index so that we can guide the light to that. So this core is what, what we are forming with this process. So to characterize it, what you can use is what you call the prism coupler method, or it's also called M-line uh, spectroscopy. So we can find which particular, you know, uh, we, we can, can we guide the light to this material. So this is what is showing the different modes or the uh, modes of uh, propagation of light within that uh, layer. So. So here you can see that uh, you can have one, two, three, four modes if it is a very thick layer. And uh, the refractive index can be then found from the material. So it's roughly around, you can produce refractive index of the order of 1.6 and a wavelength of 633 nanometer. So when you measure the refractive index, you have to measure that at a particular wavelength. So in this case, it was measured at 633 nan 633 nanometer. So the refractive index increase that you can produce. The original uh, silica glass has got a refractive index of about 1.45, and you can increase it up to 1.61. So you're essentially creating a high, very high change in the refractive index, which is uh, suitable for guiding light through that. So that's one of the advantages of this material so of process. So you can create high, very high index change or index increase in this process. And also at the same time, we can introduce the uh, ions which can emit light, say for example, erbium ion into this glass. So this black line here shows that the erbium ions which are in the silica glass in the in the, in the dark glass region. That is the emission spectrum or the fluorescent uh, uh, spectrum of the erbium ions within that material. So we're getting two functionalities and it's increasing the refractive index to the emission characteristics of the light. So we can control this process by controlling various parameters of laser, for example, like laser energy, the duration. So we can control the depth of this uh, layer, or we can control the refractive index of this layer, and we control the doping concentration of this layer by using uh, targets of different doping concentration. So this is another example. We can introduce different combinations of ions, for example, like the thulium and erbium in this case. And this is another published work. So this is uh, showing emission in the longer wavelength range, for example, in the 1600 to 2000 uh, nanometer range. So this uh, currently the, the optical communication wavelengths are mostly around the 15, 50 nanometer, so around 30 nanometer to 40 nanometer. Uh, uh, wavelength range, but as we need more and more data uh, requirements, um, and it's ever increasing. We probably need to use the longer wavelength side bit more and more. That means you need to have not just the beam amplifier, you need to amplify the longer wavelength, but also the shorter side of the wavelengths as well. So that's where these cold opens are becoming important for the future of communication. Uh, this uh, uh, we have discussed already. Uh, we can also create, say, micro lasers on the substrate. So we're creating this drop layer, which is basically the light emitting material in it, which is what you call active layer, and uh, or what you call the active media. So once you have an active media, if you create, uh, <coughs> a, a, you can create laser by bringing the mirror in. The mirror can be of different form. The mirror essentially does is to going back and forth, the light to go back and forth. Yeah? 
and uh, oscillate within that cavity and then uh, when it reaches the threshold it emits the uh, light out so you can create similar effect in a in a in a uh, in a ring or disk structure the light is confined within that material and when it reaches its um, threshold it can emit laser so so you can create micro lasers on the surface by uh, creating rings and this on the substrate which is doped with uh, these active uh, light emitting ions. You can also, uh, we also tried some of it in polymers, but the layers created are very thin layers in, uh, of nanoparticles embedded in polymers, which are also finding applications in uh, many of the displays which are coming up. Now I quickly go through some of these applications. Um, so one application we applied, this is the diabetes for the non-invasive glucose monitoring. As we know that it's a growing um, um, global problem. Diabetes is a growing problem. Uh, we can see the dark regions, the, this is more prevalent. So currently uh, people with um, diabetes, essentially people with type one diabetes, they need to measure the glucose uh, in blood several times a day. So essentially what they do is uh, pick their finger and um, take a drop of, uh, and, and to squeeze a drop of blood out and then use this strip uh, which is connected to uh, a, a machine device to measure the glucose concentration. So this is always, it's always a dream to have something which doesn't get involved in affecting your finger. Because if you know that somebody with the diabetes you have to uh, have to do this several times a day, say for six times a day or eight times a day, depending on their their conditions. So you need to go one finger to another, going back to and uh, so by doing it several times, you know, you get your fingers um, numb. And it's also a deterrent to do it. So uh, especially for children. So. Finding something which doesn't require pricking your fingers is uh, is uh, is a dream for you know uh, many years. There are several technologies being tried, um, um, and it's not still uh, fully uh, successful commercially. There are a few partially successful, but it's still an area of research of huge importance in terms of uh, the. Um, in terms of reducing the suffering of the people with diabetes. So we are thinking of, we are working on something which can be wearable, which is only a, a, a contact measurement um, using the kind of materials that we produced. Essentially get the glass, which contains this uh, layer, which we can engineer the way we wish. So the, a very simple idea is to use this implanted layer and the light can be stayed from that light, uh, monitoring its decay time uh, to, to measure the concentration of the glucose. So there are several factors involved, the, the emitted light, its wavelength, its interaction with the surface, and there will be a lot of variabilities in terms of uh, uh, measuring through the skin. Uh, there are a lot of other interfering factors involved in that. Mainly one of the most important factors is water. As you know, uh, um, a, a large um, part of the liquid uh, in, in our skin or body is um, water. So the glucose and glucose and uh, uh, water has got very similar optical properties that make it difficult to measure uh, light using light. So that's why we came up with this, uh, you know, using this particular approach. We did an early study uh, of clinical study, uh, which kind of went promised that the, 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 the concept can work, but we need further development in order to bring it into a device. So this is kind of the first uh, prototype we built to make the, do this study. Uh, so this is using a finger touch meter. So we are currently working on the next uh, prototype uh, for that uh, with the Spinal company. 
A second application that we applied the process is on strengthening the glass screens of say mobile screen, mobile uh, phones or the smartphones that you use. So the current technology, you know that most of us when you drop, it's very light. There is a very big chance of it being broken. Yes. Uh, in most of us have broken screen uh, phones, um, but sometimes not safe and it's not convenient. And uh, so how can we strengthen the glass? So essentially uh, in glasses, the breakage of glasses happens because they've got micro cracks. So it is about the size of the cracks and the density of these cracks, which ultimately leads to the failure of this glass. So if we can seal these micro cracks in this glass, then it can uh, increase its tough, or we can we can toughen it, or we can strengthen the glass, or we can reduce the chances of it being broken uh, uh, in a, uh, in an impact. So, most cases, this uh, cracks happen at the edge because that's where it's not uh, treated. Uh, this um, well, you know this glass is called uh, gorilla glass that is used in the in the in the mobile screens. They are so considered to be the toughest uh, glasses. So they essentially do is what you call the, um, a chemical process. So this chemical process change, uh, introduces some ions into this layer. So basically say the sodium ions removed by say potassium ions into that. You know that in the periodic table, the potassium comes second. Yeah, so that's a larger ion comparing to the sodium. So when you introduce so potassium ions into a uh, uh, sodium, uh, replacing sodium, you essentially need more sodium. So it basically expands the material. So then squeezes these small cranks in the material. So if you run this process for very long, you create lots of uh, loading of potassium ions into the glass by replacing the sodium ion and essentially reduce the number of cracks on the surface or the small cracks are being, uh, being sealed in this way. So what is happening is that it's, it's not healed. The, the, the crack is still there, but it is squeezed in. So, the, so it is kind of tense surface you have. So it toughens the material in this process. It creates almost 10 times um, uh, stronger than the normal glass. Uh, so the process that I described to you before, the dropping can also be used So essentially what it does is it can actually seal these gaps in the, in the surface of the glass. So the, that can reduce the uh, um, chances of it being um, cracked. So this is uh, being um, experimented in our research. And again, what uh, we discussed before, the photonic integrated circuit, so it can create amplifying and splitting and different types of components on a substrate. So this is another application area we are working on. So that's all uh, I want to discuss with you. So we kind of quickly introduced uh, about light photonics and uh, use of lasers and the application of material processing. We quickly, uh, the process that we developed, uh, which has got uh, what we call the laser dropping process using an ultra fast laser and its application in uh, different areas that we are working on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, for the wonderful session. Uh, dear participants, if you have any questions, please type in the chat box or use raise hand option to ask with the speaker. Uh, professor, there is one question in the chat box. I will read out. Yeah, the question asked by uh, Dr. Karthikeyan Nagarajan, his question is, is there any correlation between the dielectric constant of the material and photonic emission? Hmm. Yeah, okay. So, um, so it's a complicated way to answer this. Yeah, so uh, this is about, so what we say, okay, dielectric constant in a way we can say it's linked to the refractive index. Uh, so depending on the type of material, so you, you've got um, certain materials, which are say, for example, if you go to uh, semiconductors, the light emission is due to the band gap. So you've got the conduction band and the valence band 
and go to the band, band gap, which essentially determines the uh, emission characteristics of that material. Uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to what you normally call as the dielectric materials like insulators, like glasses, and so on, so you have uh, you essentially need uh, you having got a, a got or you, you uh, your band gap is so high, so it, it's an insulator. It's a band gap is so high, so it's basically in the uh, in the um, UV region, yeah. But if you want to emit, so if you want to uh, get light emission from those materials, you need to activate these materials with the uh, ions which has got energy levels. So, so it's it's a uh, uh, you, you can say yes. So the emission of that can be linked to the dielectric properties of the materials. And uh, so that way it is linked, it is, yeah, it is, uh, it has got a relation to the dielectric constant of the material. Uh, but fundamentally, I, I hope you understood the difference between these different types of material you have to uh, uh, dependent based on the dielectric constant. So it should be the influence on the dopant or influence on the host material itself. The host electric constant is what you mean. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Another one participant, uh, uh, Shukdev Pandey. Shukdev Pandey, are you there? Thank you. Yes, sir, I'm here. Yeah, you please ask with the speaker. Uh, hello, Professor Jim. Thank you for this wonderful lecture. I don't have a, a background in this, uh, in this field, so my questions may be primitive, but I would last. I would like to ask you about uh, about this uh, speed of up and down conversion that you showed uh, a slide where like there was a up conversion yeah. of the signal happening. So like since these days we have got like very high data rates. Like our uh, microprocessors are clocking at like five gigahertz. So like that would be like a, a time period of less than a nanosecond. Do you think that this uh, conversion uh, can lead to any lag or whether the, the time required for conversion is like still very less as compared to the data rates. Yeah, so um, in, in most cases of, uh, uh, so I don't want to confuse these things, so that up, so the one we use here in the amplification side is the down conversion. Okay. Yeah. So the, 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 the decay time of light or the uh, signal in that range mm -hmm. is, uh, um, is around in the, in the milliseconds range. I see. Okay. But, I see. But, okay. uh, but in an in an amplifier, you you got this light emitting in a broad range. So, for example, uh, for Airbnb, you got it from 15, 30 to say 15, 60 nanometer range. So, so it has been divided into several channels. So, so you you have this amplification happening in the old uh, old band. In a normal optical fiber communication process, and it, it is being used. So it, it's uh, so it's working in an optical fiber communication. That, that bit rates they are used, uh, it is sufficient. But when it comes to um, their emission properties in in, um, in silicon, they are much different. So um, so they so they their typical emission decay time uh, of this order, so in, in sort of milliseconds. I see. Thank you, sir. I have another question. Uh, in the ablation process, when we were like trying to build layers over the silica, uh, you there was uh, something like uh, 0.5 to 10 kilohertz. I would, I, maybe I didn't follow. Like, what was what was that oh, okay. kilohertz yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good that you noticed this. <laughs> okay, so that's the that's the number of pulses. What you call uh, pulses? coming per, per second, yeah? So that's a frequency of, of it, call it repetition rate of the laser. So- Okay, so they're so like, a, like a pulse pulses. strain? Yeah, the stream of pulses, so 500 hertz means 500, you know, 500 pulses in a second. We can right. go, that system, we can go up to 10, you know, 10,000 pulses per second. So we now have a new laser, which can go up to say one megahertz. So it's like, a, a lot of pulses in a second. So like we increase the pulse, like if we increase the this kilohertz, then we can like have a thicker layer and lesser time, something like that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 
that's that's okay. Sorry, I have one more question, sir. If you have time, uh, you you showed you showed us like the cross section of the implanted layer, probably the EDX images, yeah. and where there were like different uh, elements being uh, formed. So in 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 that particular um, slide, the zinc one, like there was the silica that that was black. Then it was like probably green or the zinc, but the top was also black again. I would like to know that it should be all green rather than no? like if the zinc is being implanted, like was the green dots for zinc or was it for something else? If you could like yeah, share so, the slide again. Yeah, a little bit. So um, I didn't really uh, uh, explain to you uh, what is the composition of the plant material I used. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this one. Yes, sir. Yeah. The next. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we use a target material here. Yeah. So right. Right. So, so like, yeah, in this one with the zinc one, sorry, it was red. So like the top, uh, the top of the red is still black. Should it be red? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So that's, um, sorry, that's, you know, you see this uh, on the top of the slides here. Yes, sir. Yes, there? sir. Yes, sir. That's a metal layer. That's what you call uh, the platinum layer. So this is. This is oh, uh, oh, that is, pla okay. Uh, that's something different. I see. Okay. What it does oh. is like, um, mm -hmm. when you, you, when we want to slice a very, very, you know, thin, uh, this is probably, the, you can see this is two microns here, yeah, isn't it? Right. It's about six microns. Mm -hmm. Right. Very small piece of uh, slice you are taking out here. Yeah? So in order mm. to hold what they do is in the process. They, oh, they, they put another layer. Oh, all right. That, yeah, I was getting confused on that. Okay, sir. Sorry about Thank that. you for... That's I was trying to say, okay, only from this point, I mean, the implanted layer I shown here. Right, okay. Yeah, thank, thank, you you so much, yeah, thank, thank you so much, Dev. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. and uh, two you. more questions are in the chat box, uh, Professor. Uh, one is asked by G. Adi Lakshmi. Her question is, uh, sir, how to make wearable sensors for monitor glucose levels? Which material better? That's a very... Very broad question, yeah. So um, there, there are so many different approaches we do uh, for wearable sensors. So I mean, we're trying for glucose for wearable uh, sensors. Either we use a sweat-based sensor, but the problem with that is it's dependent on the sweat. So that could be any kind of electrochemical-based sensor, it could be sweat-based sensor. Uh, so that's one approach. Then there is uh, people trying to use um, microwaves kind of wavelength changes to measure it. Um, so that is also under kind of research. And there's other approaches like putting some patches on the surface. So it's also involved some chemical methodology to measure it. And then all of these uh, light-based technologies, mostly infrared uh, approach, and then using mid-infrared wavelength ranges and so on. Uh, but for the time being, there's one or two companies. I mean, basically one, yeah, one company has got a wearable sensor which uses different types of sensors, which is a microwave temperature, and then kind of interpolating the uh, concentration of glucose by measuring these different parameters. The challenge is, can we measure glucose directly through skin without, uh, without, uh, you know, uh, creating any uh, pain? Or any uh, without hurting the, uh, without damaging the site, or creating any irritation and so on. So, really, there aren't any any very successful methods out there, because you, you probably have seen some announcements by um, Apple a few years back, saying that they are going to introduce it to their um, into their uh, iWatch, but it doesn't come out. It's about the technology to measure it. How do we measure it? So I'm not claiming that our technology will be the one which is successful, but we believe that it's got a chance of success. So people are trying different approaches. So it's still, still uh, it's like what you call the holy grail to find the right technology to measure glucose through skin. There was another approach uh, which was uh, discussed a few years back by Google. Uh, they, they, what you say, uh, using uh, uh, um, 
a contact lens to measure through the eye. Uh, but the issue with all of these different technologies have got certain advantages and more disadvantages. That's why they are not commercially successful. So for example, if it's a contact lens, um, you need the eyes to be, uh, you don't want the eyes to be very dry. And, uh, uh, and in many cases, people with the diabetes, it, it, uh, at certain stages, it will affect their eyes as well. And, uh, some people it will affect their eyes as well. So it might be fine, so it will be harder to say, for example, keep an uh, contact lens and so on. And you need also the associated electronic powering up all of this. So that was, that didn't came through, uh, not yet. Uh, there are, but still there are ways you can measure glucose through the eye, but for wearable, there is nothing uh, which can measure uh, clinically accurate levels. Okay. So that's where it is. So if you find something tomorrow, we'll have the market. Okay. So that's why there's a lot of interest in it. We are also buying our approach. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Thank you, Prof. And uh, another one question by Dr. Srikant. His question is, uh, what is the limitation on minimum optical power to an RBM doped fiber amplifier? Uh, okay. So, um, so there, the, um, so there, there is uh, there are, when you come when you characterize amplifier, there are two ways of looking at it. What is uh, when you use very high input power, it may not amplify. Huh? So there is uh, um, what you call the gain saturation of the material. So if you say uh, minus 30 dBm, you will get a very high gain. You can get to uh, 30 dB or 25 dB gain in a simple long fiber. Uh, but then the overall gain up you can get is limited, say for example, uh, up to a watt plus. So if you increase your input power, say up to uh, say 1 milliwatt, then the gain will be very low in that range. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor. And, uh, there are two questions in the, uh, one question in the YouTube live page, Pro. I will ask the question. You please ask the answer for the question, Pro. That question was asked by Vignesh Ganesh. His question is, uh, is all the layer suits for laser plasma doping techniques? Is all the layer suits for laser plasma doping techniques? Uh, no. Uh, so it's it's basically a combination of the target material and the substrate material. So uh, in most glasses, yes, you can do. In semiconductors, there are certain limitations. In polymers, certain limitations. So as a substrate, glasses, silica-based glasses, we have worked a lot. That definitely works. But then you have to choose the right target material as well. So the, 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 it's a combination of the substrate, the target material, and the laser parameters. We also heat this material, uh, the, the temperature of the material as well. So uh, um, that's important. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, could you please type your email ID in the chat box so that participants will be able to contact you if there is any doubts or uh, need of any help. Participants, you, uh, yeah, on behalf of uh, Chetinada College of Engineering Technology Management, Principal Ma'am, Administrative Officer, and the entire faculty members crew, I extend my sincere thanks to the speaker of today, session one, Professor Jin Zos from University of Leeds, UK, uh, for coming over here and uh, delivering his wonderful talk, even though in his earlier day. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, have a good day to you. Thank you, Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. And the information to the participants, the next session will be begin at 11.30 a.m. Uh, try to join uh, as early as possible.